Hello everyone, welcome to session 6 of LTech 620. Believe it or not, we've reached the final week of this super compact summer semester. So in this week's video, we're going to cover three topics. First, I'll introduce you to your final critical reflection. Then we'll talk about the importance of design trade-offs in design work. And finally, we'll close out with a brief recap of what we've learned this summer. So let's get started. First up, let's talk about critical reflection six. In this assignment, you're going to design your very own infographic. An infographic is a larger graphic design that combines data visualizations, illustrations, text, and images together into a format that tells a complete story. Now, you get to choose the topic of your infographic, but keep in mind that a good infographic has utility, soundness, and beauty, qualities that you'll be reading about in this week's readings. We'll get into the specifics of the assignment in a minute, but I want to point out that this assignment is meant to counter your last two assignments. Both the business card assignment and your six word story assignment were fairly narrow in scope in that they gave you a fixed amount of information and space to work with. These constraints were meant to focus you on specific concepts by avoiding a potentially overwhelming array of design options and choices. This week's assignment, on the other hand, is meant to give you a lot more latitude. The point is to challenge you with a wide open format and maximum flexibility. It's meant to give you one last opportunity to apply the principles of good design to your very own original design. Let's talk about the due date. Technically, the last day of summer one is this Friday, June 30th. However, I want to give you folks a bit longer to work in case you need or want the extra time. Therefore, Critical Reflection 6 will be due on Sunday, July 2nd at 1155 AM. If you want to hand in things earlier, that's fine. And please note that there's no peer response this week because the semester will be technically over and we're running into the July 4th holiday. That said, please feel free to check out your classmates' work. I'm sure there'll be some excellent examples. In terms of other specifics, the size of your infographic is up to you. It can really be any size. However, if you ever want to print your infographic, you may want to consider using a standard size such as letter, legal, or tabloid. The orientation is up to you, and as you will see, the assignment does ask you to use a grid in your design, and you'll need to show that in your reflection video. No matter what, the end goal is to create an infographic that is useful, sound, and beautiful. Okay, that's enough about Critical Reflection 6. Please see the assignment in Canvas for more details. Our next topic is the concept of design trade-offs. Now, the idea of design trade-offs was actually introduced by Alan Collins, a famous learning scientist from Northwestern University. In a rather famous article from 1996, Collins introduced this premise. The idea that any time we're creating learning environments for learning, there are a multitude of design decisions that need to be made. I'm sharing this with you because oftentimes in our field, we are designing graphics for learning environments. And so we might even go so far as to replace the phrase learning environments with visual representations. So the premise now is that anytime we're creating visual representations for learning, there are a multitude of design decisions that need to be made. Collins argued that often when it comes to designing things for learning, too many of the multitude of design decisions are made unconsciously without considering their consequences. Having acknowledged this reality, he went on to argue that it would be better if design decisions were considered consciously. And to try and help designers, he described an approach to making deliberate design decisions. This approach involves thinking of each design decision in terms of its costs and benefits. In order to consider the costs and benefits of a design decision, designers must ask themselves questions such as, what are the issues that must be addressed in designing visual representations? And what are the cost-benefit trade-offs associated with each design issue? And ultimately, how should the costs and benefits be weighed? Collins went on to describe various design trade-offs. Here's a sampling of them from his article. He argued that one design trade-off has to do with memorization versus thoughtfulness. We can think of this as a trade-off between quick, surface-level learning versus slower, deeper-level learning. 
Another design trade-off is whether or not a visual representation is focused on a whole task or some component skills of that task. Other trade-offs include the breadth of knowledge versus depth of knowledge, incidental versus direct learning, fun versus serious learning, learner control versus technology control, and cognitive fidelity versus physical fidelity. Now, not all of these relate directly to visual design, but many of them do. And right now, I want to emphasize the last one listed here, cognitive fidelity versus physical fidelity, and I'll do that by showing you an example. Cognitive fidelity has to do with trying to represent situations or concepts in ways that are true to how people think about them or how people think with them. In contrast, physical fidelity is more concerned with representing situations or concepts in ways that are true to their existence in the natural or real world. Collins argued that there are benefits and costs associated with stressing either cognitive or physical fidelity in a design. For example, a cost associated with stressing cognitive fidelity is that learners may not recognize particular situations in the real world because they look different. A classic example of that is this symbol used to represent a right angle in mathematics. Many students are so used to seeing this graphic in one orientation that when the graphic is rotated, students don't know that it's still a right angle. And of course, this has implications for recognizing right angles and understanding them in the real world. Other costs associated with emphasizing cognitive fidelity include losing important mappings for understanding a system. This is problematic because representations that do not include a large portion of the mapping in reality risk hiding critical elements on which people rely in the real world. Now, on the flip side, there are benefits of stressing cognitive fidelity. For example, it makes it possible to focus on the salient aspects of the situation or the concept. Another benefit is that learners do not get lost in the complexity sometimes related to natural situations or real-world scenarios. In addition, cognitive representations are often cheaper to design than high-fidelity physical representations. Let's take a look at some examples of this cognitive versus physical fidelity in graphic design. Here's an example of learning about a steam engine and how a train gets its power. In this particular picture, we see a visual representation that is really emphasizing the basics of the system. In fact, we can peel away most of the elements of the train and just focus on the salient aspects of the steam engine. In contrast, here's a much more realistic and physically accurate representation of a steam engine. What we're doing here is contrasting a visual graphic that represents cognitive fidelity with one that represents physical fidelity. As designers of visual representations, there may be moments when we need to make important decisions about which type of representation is more appropriate for the context in the target audience. Now, here's another classic example. On the left-hand side, we have the famous New York City subway map. On that map, there is disclaimer text that says, to show service more clearly, geography on this map has been modified. The designers of this map, which is used by millions of people, have prioritized showing service more clearly, calling the resulting modified geography of New York City a helpful distortion. These designers understand there's a tension between the subway map's usability and its geographic accuracy. This is an example of a design trade-off. Is it more important for the map to be usable or geographically accurate? In this case, the designers wanted to show service more clearly, at the cost of being geographically less accurate. Let's contrast this with Andrew Lynch's complete and geographically accurate New York City subway map. According to Lynch, he designed this map based on geographic and spatial data, satellite imagery, and old historic maps of NYC and the subway. The first thing you'll notice comparing these maps is that Lynch's design, on the right, does not have an up and down orientation. Instead, it's actually pivoted a little bit. Why? Well, because he's interested in physical fidelity. And in reality, Manhattan isn't pointing directly to the north like it is often portrayed in maps. And even if we pivot the map so that Manhattan is facing up and down, you can see the level of detail in Lynch's map is quite different. 
Now, if we zoom in on Grand Central Station, you can see the map on the left is representing that big complex station with a simple white circle. This is because the map is designed to help people cognitively by making the subway navigation more usable. In contrast, Grand Central Station on Lynch's physically accurate map on the right shows a lot more detail. He's mapped out all of the different train tracks at Grand Central Station and how they're spatially aligned to each other. And of course, this is interesting and it's quite beautiful, but it's not necessarily helpful for anyone thinking about navigating from point A to point B via the subway. Now, I wanted to show you these different designs as examples of design trade-offs and the decisions designers are faced with. Interestingly, there's quite a community of designers out there creating different representations of such complex information. Stepping back, I think this is an excellent example of the design trade-offs inherent when designing visual representations. And I want you to keep these ideas in mind when you're thinking about the design of your infographics. Finally, I want to take a few minutes to recap what we've covered this semester and celebrate all that you've accomplished in six short weeks. We started out the semester situating ourselves at the intersection of visual design and visual literacy. On the design side, we learned that the word design is kind of complex because it can refer to an action, an industry, and or a product. We also emphasize that when we design something, design is an action. And it's important to do that action with intention, be clear about the messages and emotions we're trying to communicate through the design, and understand how various design decisions influence a design's ability to convey information. From there, we learned about how human perception is biased and can be influenced by the past, the present, and our future goals. We learned that what we see is the result of bottom-up and top-down processing. And we learned that as designers, we can leverage empirical findings that have revealed specific feature level contrasts that can make something visual really easy to find. From there, we learned about various design principles and what constitutes good design. Week by week, we explored some of these principles and we learned about a design process we could follow to break down designing visual representations into multiple and hopefully fruitful bite-sized chunks. We learned about principles such as alignment, proximity, and repetition, and we explored the usefulness of grid systems, and we learned about the wild worlds of color and typography. And we applied what we learned to redesigning two flyers, one related to piano lessons and one related to Aikido lessons. We also experimented with different color schemes while designing a business card. And most recently, we explored the power of typography by creating six word story posters. On the visual literacy side of the equation, we learned that visual literacy is the ability to interpret, use, and create visual media in ways that advance thinking, decision-making, communication, and learning. We learned that humans aren't born knowing how to understand and make sense of visual representations. In fact, that's something we all have to learn and develop over time. And while it might seem rather simplistic at first glance, we learn that there are actually many underlying concepts that are necessary in order for someone to be able to interpret, use, and create visual media in meaningful ways. Relatedly, we learn that as consumers and producers of visual media, we can actually step back and think about the various functions that visual representations play in relation to text. Further still, we learn that if we really want to be prepared to live in today's visual society, we should be able to analyze visual content from multiple perspectives, the affective, compositional, and critical. In conclusion, I hope you feel we met the three learning objectives of the course. Number one, to analyze and evaluate visual representations from different perspectives. Number two, to create visual representations using graphic design, principles, and processes. And number three, to analyze and evaluate the role of visual representations and visual literacy in education. In terms of next steps, I want to encourage you to keep on learning about and applying those principles of good design. So much has been written and studied about them, so immerse yourself in deepening your understanding of each principle from theoretical and practical perspectives. 
Second, continue to study the world around you. What looks good? What doesn't? And more importantly, when you see something that catches your eye, study it. Really look at it and try to determine why that particular design, quote unquote, works. Before long, you'll be seeing everything around you in a whole new light. And finally, continue to apply these design principles to your own work. You would be amazed at how designing with intention and applying a handful of simple principles like alignment and balance can really make a difference in the quality of your designs. And what's great about these principles is how universal they are. They can apply to everyday flyers, to conference presentations, to website designs, and anything else involving visual representations. So with that, I'll say congratulations on finishing LTEC 620. I've been super impressed with your hard work and enthusiasm this semester. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. Have a great rest of the summer, and please keep in touch.